Well, thanks very much, Russ, and a very good evening uh, to everyone. As has been said, I'm not Stephen Hay. Um, Stephen sent me a message this morning. I got into the office just before nine. I got a message saying, Phil, call me please ASAP. Um, I thought, oh, bother, that doesn't sound good. And then I called him and he said, how's your availability today, Phil? Um, and before I could answer the question, I was bundled into a train from Edinburgh and now I find myself here this evening with the pleasure of speaking to you on a subject that really gets me fired up. So I'm delighted to be here to speak to you about optimism. I'm convinced Russ was reading my notes before this because I think we're really resonating with some of our messaging here um, and really delighted to be talking about optimism. I want to start, though, um, somewhere perhaps maybe where you might not expect. Um, I'm an investment specialist on the Billy Gifford Managed Fund. And if you're familiar with Billy Gifford, then you'll know we are an unapologetically growth-focused investment manager. You'll also, I suspect, be perhaps painfully aware that it's been an incredibly difficult period for growth investors over the last 18 to, to 24 months or so. Now, investing is hard. I think that's safe to say. However you go about it, however you go about the task, however you tackle it, whichever angle you come at it from, uh, it's not easy because there are so many knocks that come along the way. And particularly for active managers such as us, uh, we make a lot of mistakes along the way. We want to be upfront about that. But we at Bailey Gifford have been investing in largely the same way for about 100 years or so. And uh, in that time, we've learned a number of lessons. And one of them, which I want to share with you this evening, is the reason for being positive. It's really important that we stay positive as investors. That might sound a bit trite, but there are very sensible reasons uh, to do so. In the last 100 years, when we've been investing on behalf of our clients at Bailey Gifford, we've seen several crises. We've, we've heard about some of them this evening, stock market shocks. Um, we've, we've seen two world wars, the Great Depression. Um, in the slightly more recent past, we saw this. Does anyone remember what this was the logo for? Kind of logo? Millennium bug. Someone say millennium bug? This was the millennium bug. Um, just at the turn of the millennium, there was a pessimism prevailed. And um, we were in a period of crisis, really, of pessimism. If Stephen was here this evening, he would tell you about his time at the Bank of England, which is where he was at that time, and all the uncertainty that was going on. But of course, the last 20 years, we've seen a lot change. And I want to come back to some of these crises before we finish up to talk about, um, to, well, really to, to put them into context. But it's important as growth investors particularly that if we're going to err, then we err on the side of optimism. And one of the most compelling reasons for that I would like to suggest to you this evening is this chart here. I hope you can make it out. Um, this chart is what you get when you line up all of the holdings in our Bailey Gifford managed fund. So it's about 200 plus equity holdings. Um, you line up all of the equity holdings by their total return over the last 10 years. And it illustrates what's called the asymmetry of returns. In other words, in equities, when you invest in equities, your maximum downside is capped at 100%. And you'll see that in the bottom half of the page there. That's not a good outcome. That's not the sort of outcome we want to be delivering for our clients clearly, but it's the worst case scenario and, and it's a knowable quantity. But conversely, look at the top half of the chart. The upside when you invest in equities is theoretically unlimited. And just glancing at the chart, you see very, very quickly, I hope, that the outperformers over the last 10 years, which is what this chart shows, have massively outweighed those that failed to deliver. Companies like Tesla, Amazon, Ashtead, Moderna, um, which have returned multiples of their, their initial size at the beginning of that period, well in excess of 100% gains. And the point is this, if you can find, as an active manager, even a handful of those in the top half and hold them for a very long time, then you stand yourself in, in very good stead for delivering strong outcomes and, and receiving strong returns. And what should that mean for an investor in practice? Well, it means we need to lean towards optimism. We need to be far more concerned about what could go right rather than what could go wrong, because it's the ones that go right, as I say, just a handful of those strong holdings. And actually, without being too flippant about it, the ones in the bottom half don't have an impact or a drastic impact on, on 
your returns. It's about finding the outliers like are on the top, like you see on the top half of that page, the ones that go right. And by right, Russ touched on, on some of this. What I mean by that is companies that make fundamental progress, that grow operationally. We've done a lot of work at, at Bailey Gifford, as you might expect, to understand what is it that, that characterizes these outliers. And there are a number of things. Culture is a really interesting one. It's intangible, um, but that's something we really prize at Bailey Gifford when we look at companies, when we look at company management, we're, we're interested in culture. But by far and away, the thing that has the biggest impact over the long term is earnings growth. And when we talk about growth at Bailey Gifford, um, that's really what we mean. We're trying to find companies that can grow their earnings faster than the index. And in fact, if you chart this, the top quintile of earnings growers over the last 30 years have been the top quintile of returns as well. That's, those have been the best share price performers. So it's really important that we find those companies that are going to grow their earnings strongly in the long term. So we're predisposed to be optimistic and not pessimistic because that's what will drive returns. Critically, though, and this is critical, to exploit this asymmetry that you're seeing on the screen in front of you, you need to be long term in your mindset, thinking periods of at least, for our, from our perspective, at least five years, ideally more than five. And I want to show you a, a worked example of this. It's in the small print, but can anyone tell me what share price chart this is for. If anyone can read the small print, you're doing very well. This is the share price of Amazon since 1997. And if you bought Amazon stock at any point within its first decade of listing and you held it today, you'd have done a very, very good thing. I think you'll agree. There's been clearly more than just a blip. It's, it's sold off heavily in, in the recent past, in the short term. But if you've held Amazon for a, for a long time, then you've done a very good thing and it's had a positive impact on your returns. But whilst the journey looks relatively smooth, let's say up to 2021 it looked relatively smooth, but broadly speaking it's been a pretty smooth journey upwards, the experience, the lived experience of the short term has at times been quite uncomfortable and we've spotlighted here the one year period from the middle of 2004 to the middle of 2005 and a holder of Amazon over that time saw the share price half then it climbed again, then it dropped again, then it climbed again, and so on and so forth. It's been strong in the long term, but exceptionally volatile in the short term. And our research at Bailey Gifford has revealed that this is a pattern. There's a, there's a relationship between return and volatility. And in fact, the best returning stocks in the long term typically are some of the most volatile on, on the stock market. So if we're to exploit that asymmetry, then we've got to be able to acknowledge that short-term bumps will come. They can be very uncomfortable. They have been. They've been very uncomfortable in the recent past. I think we'll all agree. But we should expect them because often these, these best returning stocks are going to be some of the most volatile. So we shouldn't be put off by volatility, but in fact, we should embrace it. But it really only works if you're willing to take a genuinely long-term mindset in your investing. That five, from our perspective, certainly five-year-plus view now, Amazon's a cherry-picked example, but I can hear some of you asking, that's all good and well. How does this work at the fund level? Well, again, taking the managed funds, the managed fund as an example, our 35-year history has shown that there will be volatility over short periods. But as you expand your time horizon, those returns become much smoother and they skew towards the positive side. And that's what you're looking at on the chart here. What you're seeing is on a rolling basis, the, the managed fund in the last 35 years, over 12 months, could return anywhere from up almost 50%, down almost 30. So if you had a, a one-year mindset, you're, you know, you've seen, you would have seen those very, very volatile returns. And it's lost money for clients in an absolute sense, 23% of the time. Could be worse, but still 23% quite meaningful. But as you expand that time horizon, that number becomes 6% over five years. That is to say, we've lost money for clients in the managed fund, 6% of the time of rolling five-year periods. Um, but 10 plus, it's a much smoother return on, on the positive side. And that's true actually of six years plus, although that data point is not on the screen here. And this is why I think it can be extremely difficult to be optimistic because like we're seeing now, the bumps come and the short-term uh, volatility is especially uncomfortable. And we see this particularly for growth businesses. Um, Russ has touched on some of the, the macroeconomic environment that we've seen with high rates and a lot of the uncertainty, a lot of pessimism. And the businesses that we at Bailey Gifford are looking for 
typically have the majority of their earnings in the future. And in fact, they, they're willing to forego profitability today and they would rather invest their free cash flow for growth in the future. But the market, as we know, is allergic to uncertainty. And one of the, the things that we've seen in this cocktail of crises recently is everything coming together just to create an environment of pure uncertainty. And people are running to the, the perceived safety of, of companies in much mature industries, let's say, growing their earnings much at a much lower amount, but, but stable and predictable. And, and you know, that, that has strengths. And for some people, that will be perhaps exactly the right thing for them to be looking for. But it's meant that growth companies like those we look for have been especially out of favor. And in fact, the, the, the range, the minimum and maximum of that one-year figure have been experienced within the last two years, both. 2020, we saw our strongest year, and uh, end of Q1 2022 was one of our weakest years in, in, in this fund's history. So short-term bumps, but we need to expect them and we need to maintain that long-term mindset. And let's be upfront about this. I think for that reason, growth investing isn't gonna be suitable for everyone. That's, that's a decision for you alongside your advisors. And we're hearing about funds tonight that perhaps may, may or may not be more suitable for you. I'll leave that to you to decide. But um, if you're choosing growth managers for your portfolio, yes, the optimism matters, but the time horizon needs to be aligned as well. We've got to be thinking in, in similar terms. So that's at a, a very high level, some of the why of optimism, because actually we think if we're predisposed to be optimistic, then we're far more likely to deliver strong outcomes for our clients and investors in the managed fund and many other Bailey Gifford funds on a long-term view. But I do want to get into the, the what. What is there to be optimistic about today? We're in a, a peak fear situation like some of those we've seen in the past. And there's a myth which I, I really want to dispel this evening, which is to say the best of growth is gone. We were making hay while the sun shines. Growth had a fabulous decade but there's no more to go for from here. Opportunities for growth are lacking and the best is behind us. And that's, I think, a very understandable sentiment. It's been, a, it's been an incredibly challenging year, but it's also a sentiment that we at Bailey Gifford would humbly disagree with. Um, and if you're willing to look for them, the patient, optimistic investor has opportunities abounding in every corner of the market. And here's some examples um, among many of where we are enthusiastic just now. Wasn't going to go through each of these in, in lots of detail, but I wanted to pick up some examples and give you a flavor of, of the sorts of things um, that, that we are finding. And the first, uh, we've, we've bucketed these broadly speaking and pulled out an example. The first I wanted to draw your attention to is Greg's. This has been something of a, a darling growth stock actually in the UK. And we often think growth and tech are synonymous. Not sure how many people would put Greg's remotely in the tech bracket, um, but it's a company that's innovated over its long history. Now, of course, famous for its steak bakes and sausage rolls. And for us, the question is, okay, that was strong growth. Where's Act 2 for Greg's? What's next? And really interestingly, where Greg's is seeing an opportunity is in the evening meal market, would you believe? So there is no longer any shame in, in grabbing a steak bake or a sausage roll on your way home from the office. In fact, that's to be encouraged. And we think that Greg's strong brand is likely to serve it very, very well. Um, even in periods of recession, Typically, people don't necessarily stop eating out, but they adjust their pricing point accordingly. And actually, that should give Greg's plen plenty of, of pricing power, albeit it's not exactly at the top end. It's not at the premium end, um, but it's been growing at its sales far higher than the rest of the hospitality market. And we think is a quality brand. You could pull out other examples. We had Games Workshop in the UK, a tabletop um, board game. Um, Richemont, which is a luxury goods manufacturer that owns companies like Gucci. There are a, hand, a, a, a selection of stocks that come under that strong consumer brand area and which should offer pricing power for, we think, a, a long, long time to come. At the other end of, of the spectrum, the other end of the slide is Reliance Industries. I'm not sure how many of you will be familiar with this company, but this is a, an Indian conglomerate. It's got a long history in, in energy primarily, but it's been moving into to connectivity. It's rolling out ultra high speed internet for millions of businesses and homes across India. And we've seen the impact that the internet has on, on our day-to-day -day lives. It's changed the way that we interact. It's changed the way that we receive entertainment. It's changed the way that advertisers put their adverts in front of us. 
And that is, a, a, in, in a sense, a foundational technology now that things have been, have been built on, and you could you know, count, count many, many, many of them. But in India, it's in, it's in its early days. And actually, we think that will, A, be a, a huge opportunity and is a huge opportunity for Reliance Industries. It's spending more than $20 billion on that rollout. But it should also create much more innovation in, in India as well as it's overtaking China as the world's most populous country. So two very different businesses doing very different things, but both, we think, strong growth opportunities. Elsewhere, we've got companies in, in what, what we've labeled here the niche industrials bracket. IMCD is a company I'd be shocked if anyone was, was familiar with, but it's a, a specialty chemicals distributor in Rotterdam. This is a company with a very, it's the biggest player in its market, but still a very low market share. Um, now, this is a serial acquirer, so it might not tick one of, one of Russ's boxes, um, but its, its management team has shown incredible capital discipline, um, and it's grown through acquisition, and, and it maintains very strong pricing power. And there are other companies, continental Europe has a really strong pedigree of, of niche industrials, and you could put others in there, like Atlas Copco, the, the plant equipment manufacturer, um, and in the UK as well, Ashted, which is actually our best performer over 10 years in the managed fund, and that's a UK plant rental equipment company. Um, CRISPR Therapeutics, another one doing some amazing stuff, which it's very clever people doing very clever things, sequencing genomes, and particularly with a focus on, on sickle cell disease. So growth is to be found across sectors and across geographies, and if there, were, if there was one message I wanted to leave with you tonight, that might be one of the messages. It's that growth and tech are not synonymous. It's not about finding companies that look high on a valuation basis or have a founder that's on Twitter too much or that sort of thing. But actually, it's to be found across sectors, across geographies, because for us, it's about um, growing earnings. And you know, a company like Greg's, we're not expecting to blow the lights out. It's that, that steady compounder. It's that flavor of growth. CRISPR, perhaps, the outcomes are more binary. Um, but if they do, if it does come off, it'll, be, it'll make plenty, plenty of money for investors. But growth is to be found across the spectrum. I think that's really, really important to get across. So we think there's a lot to like about growth equities just now. And there are great opportunities um, for the investors willing to be optimistic and patient. Now, you can tell that this was a slide for Stephen. Stephen's our head of fixed income research. Um, and I promised him I would talk about the bonds. Because actually, you know, Bonds, bonds have been a really key part of the managed fund's portfolio. Um, the managed fund is 75% equities, 25% bonds. And the bonds are there for two reasons. One is diversification versus equities, and the other is to generate a return in and of themselves. And what this chart shows is the yield on investment-grade bonds. So these are high-quality companies, uh, safe investments, triple B and above by, from the ratings agencies. And you'll see the extent to which that yield has come up. Now, as a reminder... In bonds, as yields rise, prices fall, and vice versa. Now, our, our bond team believes um, that we are at or near peak inflation. Probably, we wouldn't like to necessarily hang our hat on that view, but broadly speaking, that's, that's kind of the view that's, that we're coalescing around. And we think that from here, yields are likely to come down rather than up, and we should benefit from that price appreciation as the yields come down. And we have been adding to names such as JP Morgan, NatWest, high quality businesses, loads of cash on the balance sheet, but actually paying yields north of 5%. So we think as rates go up, there's plenty of opportunity for return for investors. We also think bonds remain a good diversifier. There's been a lot of press recently, you might have seen that's quite anti 60 40 funds, as they're sometimes known. The managed fund, it's a 75 25 fund, but same kind of idea. Um, but the, the work that we have done suggests that the, the bonds in the managed fund are a better diversifier for the equities in the managed fund than the index. So on a, on a very simple basis, yes, bonds are more correlated, which means perhaps less of a good diversifier. But actually, as an active manager, we don't hold anything we don't want to hold. We're choosing individual bonds, um, and we think they still offer plenty of diversification. So we think there's a lot to like about bonds, and they still offer meaningful return potential as well as diversification. Now, as I draw to a conclusion, I mentioned the, the millennium bug at the, the turn of the millennium, clearly. And we were in that other peak fear situation. The dot-com bubble had not long burst, and pessimism prevailed, and people were, were, were feeling that in a very pronounced way. But the next 20 plus years brought immense innovation. The phones that many of you will have in your pockets now were the stuff of science fiction. 
in the year 2000. We're, we're plugging cars in instead of fueling them at petrol stations, and they're some of the fastest cars on the road, by the way. In China, they're building apartments without kitchens because it's cheaper and more efficient to have your food delivered by someone on a moped than it is actually to go to the bother of cooking it yourself. That's very attractive for some people, I can tell, very attractive prospect. We're sequencing vaccines in a matter of days rather than a matter of years. Moderna actually went back and checked its results when it was doing the COVID vaccine because it couldn't believe how quickly it had been able to sequence that vaccine. And that was just in the space of 20 years. And we stand at a point again today, a similar juncture of, of fear, of pessimism. And actually our suggestion to you would be that there is still a huge amount of opportunity. As, as Russ has said, this is, this is the time when others are pessimistic. This is the time where we might expect to see some really strong growth come through. Clearly, the, the companies of, of the previous boom will look different from the next. We have to acknowledge that, and that's why it's so important that active managers like us are on the hunt for the companies that are building the future. But we're really, really optimistic about the opportunities that we are finding. And just to finish, the bumps will come again. We don't know when. We don't know to what extent. But we know that the bumps will come. And there have been many in the Managed Fund's 35-year history. You'll see a bunch here. We, we launched the fund about six months before Black Monday, which was very poor timing on our part. But actually, with that long-term view, the fund has been able to see through crises, maintaining a long-term mindset. And um, our process is fundamentally unchanged. And if you're willing and able to take a long-term and optimistic mindset in your growth investing, then you set yourself up for success. So my time's up. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.